in 5.7, our objective is to integrate using inverse trig functions. So last time, 5.6, we took the derivative of inverse trig functions. So this time we're going backwards, taking the integral to get to inverse trig functions. So notice what we start with. These three integrals are rational functions. And in rational functions, we've employed different strategies in order to take the antiderivative. Well, we now have another strategy. Sometimes the rational function will be of one of three forms that give us an inverse trig function. We have to learn to recognize these three forms. So here are some things that I'm going to point out to you. Notice that two of the forms have radicals in the denominator. Two of the forms have radicals. Now, as you read these three formulas, some things that are important to remember is, one, A is a constant. So therefore, you're going to see it usually as numbers. And U represents a variable expression. A is a constant, and U represents a variable expression. Also, that A is a constant that is greater than 0. A has to be greater than 0. So A is a constant that's greater than 0, and U is a variable expression. So as we look at these three forms of rational integrands, notice that two of them have radicals. The one with sine has a radical. The one with secant has a radical. Arc sine and arc secant come from radicals. So if you don't see a radical, it's probably not one of those. If the variable expression is the one being subtracted or the one that's second in the difference, we're probably aiming for an arc sine form. If the variable expression comes first in the difference, meaning it's the variable expression minus the constant expression, then we're probably aiming for the arc secant form of the antiderivative. Also, arc secant has a variable expression on the outside, but that can sometimes be manipulated. What can't really be manipulated is when we're subtracting the signs of those expressions. So notice the variable expression is first or is positive. The constant expression is after or is negative. That's in the arc secant form. In the arc sine form, just the opposite. Constant first minus variable expression. Notice the arctangent form has no radical in it, and it's the sum of the denominator. So what we're going to do today is just learn how to recognize what kind of form that it is, what kind of arc sine, arc tangent, or arc secant are we looking at, or maybe none of the above. Mostly, and uh, I'm going to go back to this real fast because it's important for you to make yourself a note that these must be memorized. So adding to your list of what to memorize, three more. Why is it only three and not arc cosine, arc cotangent, and arc cosecant? Well, remember when we took the derivatives of those, they were different only by a factor of negative one. So basically, they are just about the same thing. So let's think about evaluating the following integrals and what is our strategy for how we figure out which one that it is. If I see a rational function, I usually have a list of things to think of in my head. Today, we are going to talk about which of our three arc trig functions, inverse trig functions, we are looking at. So I notice that there is a radical in the denominator. So I ask myself, is it either the arc sine or the arc secant? Because the t arc tangent doesn't have a radical in the denominator. Next thing I go to is when I'm subtracting, where is the variable expression? Is it positive or negative? I see that the variable expression in this one is second, so it's a constant minus a variable. Therefore, it looks more like the arc sine expression, not the arc secant. In either of the cases, this is just a, a preliminary method to say I, I'm trying to head for it to look like the formula that we wrote first. In any case, I want to identify what are all the parts in the formula. So if I'm thinking arc secant, what I'm trying to, or arc sine, what I'm trying to make it look like is the integral of du over the square root of 
9, not 9, that's what I have there, excuse me, uh, a squared minus u squared, a constant expression minus a variable expression, both of which are perfect squares. So I would like to identify what is my a squared that I see here and what is my u squared that I see there. So if the constant expression is supposed to be first, this should be my a squared, this should be my u squared. So I write off to the side, a squared is probably 9, and notice in my formula, if we write the rest of it, I'm going to have to know u and a. So therefore, after I write down what a squared is and what u squared is, I write down what a is. So if a squared is 9, a is the square root of 9. If u squared is x squared, u is the square root of x squared. Now, anytime we've ever identified a u, that's a type of substitution, we take the derivative, du dx. So let's follow through with that. We also then solve for dx. Now, I've said in the past that we never just do a u substitution that is just a variable. But remember, this is a different situation. We're trying to make it look like that arc sine integral, where I will get arc sine from that integral expression. So now let's substitute and see if that's what we have. A squared is 9, so we put the a squared in that spot. u squared is x squared, so we put the u squared in that spot, and it is exactly like that. There's nothing remaining. So we know that we have the arc sine of u over a plus c or I substitute what is u and what is a back into this u is x, a is 3 arc sine of x over 3 plus c. I don't normally circle or box my answers, but in this case I want you to know that is my final answer because I've got x and the number plugged back in. Let's take a look at a, another example. I see a radical in the denominator in number 2. So again, I start by asking myself, perhaps this is arc sine or is it arc secant? Well, where's the variable expression? It's first this time, variable expression minus constant expression. So that tells me arc secant is probably the one we go with. If we think it's arc secant, let's write down our formula for arc secant. The integral of du over u times the integral or the radical, the square root, <laughs> u times the square root of u squared minus a squared. And that will equal 1 over a times the arc secant of absolute value of u over a plus c. That's where we're headed if we can identify all the parts and get them to successfully look like that. So let's try to identify all those parts. I look in the variable expression and I see if this is supposed to be the variable expression, this should be my u squared. This is the constant expression, so this should be my a squared. So off to the side or somewhere nearby, I write that a squared equals 16, u squared equals 9x squared. Therefore, a, the square root of 16, is 4. u, the square root of 9x squared, is 3x. Remember, when we identify a u, we, ident we do the derivative of it, du dx is 3. Therefore, dx is du over 3. Let's do some substitution into our integral and see if it looks like that. Now we didn't have to do that in this one because the a squared and the u squared just work everything that we saw there. There were only symbols remaining, no numbers or letters. So I'm going to take what we have from our integral from in here and start plugging stuff in. So dx is du over 3. du over 3. Let's write what we have now. Integral of du over 3, right? du over 3. There's still an x there, so x. Square root u squared, I take a squared, I take u squared minus a squared. Now, 
3x. There's a variable expression left here, but remember u is 3x, so take out the 3x and put u in its place. There are other ways to make these substitutions. I see that I have the form that creates the arc secant when I do the antiderivative, therefore I have 1 over a arc secant of absolute value of u over a plus c. Now we substitute the a's and the u's. The a is 4, so into here I put 4, 1 fourth, arc secant, u says 3x, so absolute value of 3x. A is 4, so over 4, plus C. There we go. Let's see what number 3 looks like. We have a quotient. So normally, thinking of all the ways we've dealt with quotients, we go through that in our head. But today, we're focusing on how to see it as a quotient that leads to one of our inverse trig antiderivatives. I see no square root, therefore the only one that has that is arctangent. So perhaps I'm looking at an arctangent situation. Well, before we just jump into the fact that it is probably arctangent because that's the section of the book that we're in, remember the other strategies that we've employed in the past when we have a quotient? Do you remember what one of them is? Making the denominator the u is one of those strategies. So if we were to try this, and I'm going to do this on the side because I don't want to say I know this is going to work. I just want you to consider that this is something that we try. What I'm saying that we try is taking the denominator and making the u. This is something we've done in the past. The denominator, denominator equals the u. So let's see what happens if we say u is 1 plus e to the 4x. We take the derivative and we get 4e to the 4x. We solve for dx and we get du over 4e to the 4x. So dx is du over 4e to the 4x. So when we make the denominator u, usually what happens is the things cancel out that are uh, the leftover x's. But I see an e to the 2x and an e to the 4x. Those aren't going to cancel out. I'm actually going to be left with e to the 2x in the denominator, which would require more substitution not very helpful in this problem. So even though we think of the methods of things like making the denominator the u, and we try that, now we think of other methods like maybe this is the arctangent form. I'm going to write it over here because I want to ask myself what form does that look like and I don't want it to be confused with what we tried over there. So here's what we're aiming for it to look like if it's going to be arctangent. The integral of du over a squared plus u squared. If it is that, then we know that this will be equal to 1 over a arctangent of u over a plus c. It helps to have them memorize and write them down. If it is of this form, then we will identify the a squared is the constant expression plus u squared is the variable expression, the expression that has the variable in it. When we do that, we write down to the side what is a squared and what is u squared so that we can write down what is a and what is u because we need those for our antiderivative. If a squared is 1, the square root of 1 is 1. If u squared is e to the 4x, think of e to the 4x as e to the 2x squared, right? Because 2 times 2x is 4x, therefore u is e to the 2x. Remember that when we identify a u, we immediately do du dx. Using the chain rule, this is 2 e to the 2x. Solve for dx and see that it's du over 2 e to the 2x. Let's go plug that stuff back in to our integral. So, taking this integral right here, finding some room, we will do the integral 2e to the 2x. 
dx comes out in its place, what dx equals? du over 2e to the 2x over. 1 is a squared. We're substituting e to the 4x we said should be u squared. So far it's looking pretty good because the 2e to the 2x cancels with that 2e to the 2x. What do we have left over? The integral of du over a squared plus u squared, which is the exact form that gives us the arc tangent of u over a. Let's go ahead and fill in what we get from that. 1 over a, arc tangent of u over a plus c. a we see is 1, u we see is e to the 2x. So we can say this equals 1 over 1 arc tangent of e to the 2x over 1 plus c. We definitely don't want to leave all those ones. We can clean that up quite easily. Therefore, this is our prettiest answer. What do we think about this one? Number four. Well, we have talked about some strategies that we employ when we see quotients. In fact, let's go back up to the top of our notes and write down some of those strategies. So we are going to list the strategies for integrating quotients. Some things to think about when you have a quotient as your integral. Because from now on, it's not all going to be an inverse trig function. We still have a variety of options. The first thing I tend to think it is, can I divide and make it not a quotient? Such as the integral of, let's say, 4 minus x squared over x dx. This can be easily divided because there's one term in the denominator, but sometimes even when there's more than one term in the denominator, it can be divided into the numerator. What makes me usually think that is one term in the denominator or a degree of the numerator that's higher. But I usually ask myself this question first, can I divide the denominator into the numerator? For this one, I can divide and I end up with a simpler integral of 4 over x minus x dx and then I do the antiderivative of each one in parts. The second thing I think of is a u substitution. So I ask myself, can I do a u substitution? Sometimes what that means is the denominator is the u, such as an example like the following the integral of, let's see, I'm going to start with the denominator and call it something like x squared plus 5. The numerator, perhaps it's something like x. Well, in this case, notice that the degree on the bottom is bigger than the degree on the top, which means when I take the derivative of the bottom, I get something that's like the top, therefore I end up with a u prime over u scenario, u prime over u. And we know that those turn into, when we do the antiderivative, the natural log of u. So if the denominator is u, I end up with a u prime over u, and therefore that makes the natural log of the absolute value of u. That's something I think about for u substitution. The other thing I think about for u substitution is that I let something complicated equal the u. And I do just a general u substitution. Maybe it's the denominator. Maybe it's a function that I don't know the antiderivative of, like the natural log of x. This is a problem we've had recently. What do I make the u in this scenario, this complicated function, whom I don't know its derivative, or rather its antiderivative. So I want it out of the picture. I call it the u. So those are some things we think about, u substitution for the denominator or a complicated expression. The third thing to think about now is maybe it's one of our arc, I'm going to call it inverse trig setups. Maybe it's one of these three. So our strategies are ones that we have to know. 
add these strategies to your flashcards as you memorize the formulas. Let's go back and take a look at number four. In number four, I ask myself in the order, can I divide this? Well, with a radical expression, usually no. Second, I ask myself, can I do a U substitution? Because often that's going to be the next most accessible technique. If I were to ask myself about a U substitution when I see a radical, my thought is perhaps what's under the radical could be my U. Well, let's just take a moment off to the side and say, well, what if I call U that stuff that's in the radical? What would my DU DX look like? negative 2x. Is it what I have on top? No. I have the x on top that I could cancel out with the x that's in the derivative, but the plus 5 makes me unable to do that. So I don't want the plus 5 to be there. Well, what's the way to take care of that? Split it up. Split the x away from the plus 5. Now let's take another moment and say if we are trying the method of u sub, that doesn't seem to work. What's the other tactic we are thinking of? Is it one of our inverse trig forms? Well, I see a radical and I see the variable expression comes second. Therefore, I ask myself if it's inverse trig, I'm thinking arc sine. Well, if it's arc sine, I have to say, what is the a squared? That would be the 25. What is the u squared? That would be the x squared. Therefore, a is the square root of 25, and u is the square root of x squared. Well, du then is just dx, and I am left with x plus 5 in the numerator. So that really doesn't seem helpful either. But let's go back to that original thought of doing the u substitution. If I had just an x up here, it would cancel out because dx is du over negative 2x. It would cancel out with this x. But I have the plus 5 to worry about. So let's go back to option number 1, division. What do I mean by division is essentially splitting up the numerator. So here's what we could try sometimes is a form of rewriting, which we can call something like division or splitting up. Here's what I mean by that. The integral of x over the square root of 25 minus x squared plus dx plus the integral of 5 over the square root of 25 minus x squared dx. I've divided because I divided the denominator into both parts of the numerator and got this. Why is that helpful? Well, remember our two techniques, the u substitution technique that now can work for this because I don't have that pesky plus 5 attached, and my inverse trig technique for the second part, because now I don't have any variable expressions in the numerator that are keeping me from getting that form of the arc sine antiderivative. So let's do those two separately for each integral. In the first one, doing my u substitution, dx is du over negative 2x. All of the stuff under the radical, we said call it u. So let's rewrite what we have at this point. The integral of x over the square root of u times du over negative 2x. Looking good because x cancels with x. The negative 2 can be pulled out, negative 1 half. Integral 1 over the square root of u is easier to deal with if we write it as a power u to the negative 1 half du. On this guy, we can use our power rule, negative 1 half. On the outside, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent really uh, means multiply by the reciprocal. So instead of divide by 1 half, I can multiply by 2 over 1. Okay. And then, of course, plus c, but we'll save the plus c to the end. Let's continue this one. The 2 over 1 cancels the 1 half, but we have negative. u to the 1 half means square root of u. 
and u, putting it back in, is 25 minus x squared. That's our first integral. Next integral, we said let 25 be the a squared, let x squared be the u squared, and therefore du is just dx. Let's rewrite what that one looks like. Integral of pesky 5 is just a constant multiple, pull it out. du is now left on top over the square root of a squared minus u squared. Well, aside from the factor of 5, this does look exactly like our arc sine setup. Therefore, let's continue with the arc sine. 5 continues on the outside. This is the arc sine of u over a. Plug back in what u and a are. 5 times the arc sine. u is x, a is 5, and now we have our second part. Put those two parts together, this guy, this guy, and a plus, and a plus c, and we have our answer. Negative square root of 25 minus x squared plus 5 arc sine of x over 5 plus c. Sometimes you have to think of multiple methods for one problem. It's pretty fun though when you figure it out.